Moby Dick Chapter 41 Moby Dick I, Ishmael, was one of that crew, my shots had gone up with the rest, my oath had been welded with theirs, and stronger I shouted, and more did I hammer and clinch my oath, because of the dread in my soul. A wild, mystical, sympathetical feeling was in me, Ahab's quenchless feud seemed mine. With greedy ears I learned the history of that murderous monster against whom I and all the others had taken our oaths of violence and revenge. For some time past, though at intervals only, the unaccompanied, secluded white whale had haunted those uncivilized seas mostly frequented by the sperm whale fishermen. But not all of them knew of his existence, only a few of them, comparatively, had knowingly seen him, while the number who as yet had actually and knowingly given battle to him, was small indeed. For, owing to the large number of whale cruisers, the disorderly way they were sprinkled over the entire watery circumference, many of them adventurously pushing their quest along solitary latitudes, so as seldom or never for a whole twelvemonth or more on a stretch, to encounter a single news-telling sail of any sort, the inordinate length of each separate voyage, the irregularity of the times of sailing from home, all these, with other circumstances, direct and indirect, long obstructed the spread through the whole worldwide whaling fleet of the special individualizing tidings concerning Moby Dick. It was hardly to be doubted that several vessels reported to have encountered, at such or such a time, or on such or such a meridian, a sperm whale of uncommon magnitude and malignity, which whale, after doing great mischief to his assailants, had completely escaped them. To some minds it was not an unfair presumption, I say, that the whale in question must have been no other than Moby Dick. Yet as of late the sperm whale fishery had been marked by various and not unfrequent instances of great ferocity, cunning, and malice in the monster attacked, therefore it was, that those who by accident ignorantly gave battle to Moby Dick, such hunters, perhaps, for the most part, were content to ascribe the peculiar terror he bred, more, as it were, to the perils of the sperm whale fishery at large, than to the individual cause. In that way, mostly, the disastrous encounter between Ahab and the whale had hitherto been popularly regarded. And as for those who, previously hearing of the white whale, by chance caught sight of him, in the beginning of the thing they had every one of them, almost, as boldly and fearlessly lowered for him, as for any other whale of that species. But at length, such calamities did ensue in these assaults, not restricted to sprained wrists and ankles, broken limbs, or devouring amputations, but fatal to the last degree of fatality, those repeated disastrous repulses, all accumulating and piling their terrors upon Moby Dick, those things had gone far to shake the fortitude of many brave hunters, to whom the story of the white whale had eventually come. Nor did wild rumors of all sorts fail to exaggerate, and still the more horrify the true histories of these deadly encounters. For not only do fabulous rumors naturally grow out of the very body of all surprising terrible events, as the smitten tree gives birth to its fungi, but, in maritime life, far more than in that of terra firma, wild rumors abound, wherever there is any adequate reality for them to cling to. And as the sea surpasses the land in this matter, so the whale fishery surpasses every other sort of maritime life, in the wonderfulness and fearfulness of the rumors which sometimes circulate there. For not only are whalemen as a body unexempt from that ignorance and superstitiousness hereditary to all sailors, but of all sailors, they are by all odds the most directly brought into contact with whatever is appallingly astonishing in the sea, face to face they not only eye its greatest marvels, but, hand to jaw, give battle to them. Alone, in such remotest waters, that though you sailed a thousand miles, and passed a thousand shores, you would not come to any chiseled hearthstone, or aught hospitable beneath that part of the sun, in such latitudes and longitudes, pursuing to such a calling as he does, the whaleman is wrapped by influences all tending to make his fancy pregnant with many a mighty birth. No wonder, then, that ever gathering volume from the mere transit over the widest watery spaces, the outblown rumors of the white whale did in the end incorporate with themselves all manner of morbid hints, and half-formed fetal suggestions of supernatural agencies, which eventually invested Moby Dick with new terrors unborrowed from anything that visibly appears. So that in many cases such a panic did he finally strike, that few who by those rumors, at least, had heard of the white whale, few of those hunters were willing to encounter the perils of his jaw. But there were still other and more vital practical influences at work. Not even at the present day has the original prestige of the sperm whale, as fearfully distinguished from all other species of the leviathan, died out of the minds of the whalemen as a body. There are those this day among them, who, though intelligent and courageous enough in offering battle to the Greenland or right whale, would perhaps either from professional inexperience, or incompetency, or timidity, decline a contest with the sperm whale, 
at any rate, there are plenty of whalemen, especially among those whaling nations not sailing under the American flag, who have never hostilely encountered the sperm whale, but whose sole knowledge of the Leviathan is restricted to the ignoble monster primitively pursued in the north, seated on their hatches, these men will hearken with a childish fireside interest and awe to the wild, strange tales of southern whaling. Nor is the preeminent tremendousness of the great sperm whale anywhere more feelingly comprehended than on board of those prows which stem him. And as if the now tested reality of his might had in former legendary times thrown its shadow before it, we find some book naturalists Olassen and Pavelson declaring the sperm whale not only to be a consternation to every other creature in the sea, but also to be so incredibly ferocious as continually to be a thirst for human blood. Nor even down to so late a time as Cuvier's, were these or almost similar impressions effaced. For in his natural history, the baron himself affirms that at sight of the sperm whale, all fish, sharks included, are struck with the most lively terrors, and often in the precipitancy of their flight dash themselves against the rocks with such violence as to cause instantaneous death. And however the general experiences in the fishery may amend such reports as these, yet in their full terribleness, even to the bloodthirsty item of Pavelson, the superstitious belief in them is, in some vicissitudes of their vocation, revived in the minds of the hunters. So that overawed by the rumors and portents concerning him, not a few of the fishermen recalled, in reference to Moby Dick, the earlier days of the sperm whale fishery, when it was oftentimes hard to induce long-practiced right whalemen to embark in the perils of this new and daring warfare, such men protesting that although other leviathans might be hopefully pursued, yet to chase in point lance at such an apparition as the sperm whale was not for mortal man. That to attempt it, would be inevitably to be torn into a quick eternity. On this head, there are some remarkable documents that may be consulted. Nevertheless, some there were, who even in the face of these things were ready to give chase to Moby Dick, and a still greater number who, chancing only to hear of him distantly and vaguely, without the specific details of any certain calamity, and without superstitious accompaniments, were sufficiently hardy not to flee from the battle if offered. One of the wild suggestions referred to, as at last coming to be linked with the white whale in the minds of the superstitiously inclined, was the unearthly conceit that Moby Dick was ubiquitous, that he had actually been encountered in opposite latitudes at one and the same instant of time. Nor, credulous as such minds must have been, was this conceit altogether without some faint show of superstitious probability. For as the secrets of the currents and the seas have never yet been divulged, even to the most erudite research, so the hidden ways of the sperm whale when beneath the surface remain, in great part, unaccountable to his pursuers, and from time to time have originated the most curious and contradictory speculations regarding them, especially concerning the mystic modes whereby, after sounding to a great depth, he transports himself with such vast swiftness to the most widely distant points. It is a thing well known to both American and English whale ships, and as well a thing placed upon authoritative record years ago by Scoresby, that some whales have been captured far north in the Pacific, in whose bodies have been found the barbs of harpoons darted in the Greenland seas. Nor is it to be gainsaid, that in some of these instances it has been declared that the interval of time between the two assaults could not have exceeded very many days. Hence, by inference, it has been believed by some whalemen that the Norwest Passage, so long a problem to man, was never a problem to the whale. So that here, in the real living experience of living men, the prodigies related in old times of the inland Strello Mountain in Portugal, near whose top there was said to be a lake in which the wrecks of ships floated up to the surface, and that still more wonderful story of the Arethusa fountain near Syracuse, whose waters were believed to have come from the Holy Land by an underground passage. These fabulous narrations are almost fully equaled by the realities of the whalemen. Forced into familiarity, then, with such prodigies as these, and knowing that after repeated, intrepid assaults, the white whale had escaped alive, it cannot be much matter of surprise that some whalemen should go still further in their superstitions, declaring Moby Dick not only ubiquitous, but immortal, for immortality is, but ubiquity in time, that though groves of spears should be planted in his flanks, he would still swim away unharmed, or if indeed he should ever be made to spout thick. Blood, such a sight would be but a ghastly deception, for again in uninsanguined billows hundreds of leagues away, his unsullied jet would once more be seen. But even stripped of these supernatural surmisings, there was enough in the earthly make and incontestable character of the monster to strike the imagination with unwanted power. For, it was not so much his uncommon bulk that so much distinguished him from other sperm whales, but, as was elsewhere thrown out a peculiar snow-white wrinkled forehead, and a high, pyramidical white hump. 
These were his prominent features, the tokens whereby, even in the limitless, uncharted seas, he revealed his identity, at a long distance, to those who knew him. The rest of his body was so streaked, and spotted, and marbled with the same shrouded hue, that, in the end, he had gained his distinctive appellation of the White Whale, a name, indeed, literally justified by his vivid aspect, when seen gliding at high noon through a dark blue sea, leaving a Milky Way wake of creamy foam all spangled with golden gleamings. Nor was it his unwanted magnitude, nor his remarkable hue, nor yet his deformed lower jaw, that so much invested the whale with natural terror, as that unexampled, intelligent malignity which, according to specific accounts, he had over and over again evinced in his assaults. More than all, his treacherous retreats struck more of dismay than perhaps aught else. For, when swimming before his exulting pursuers, with every apparent symptom of alarm, he had several times been known to turn round suddenly, and, bearing down upon them, either stave their boats to splinters, or drive them back in consternation to their ship. Already several fatalities had attended his chase. But those similar disasters, however little brooded ashore, were by no means unusual in the fishery, yet, in most instances, such seemed the white whale's infernal aforethought of ferocity, that every dismembering or death that he caused, was not wholly regarded as having been inflicted by an unintelligent agent. Judge, then, to what pitches of inflamed, distracted fury the minds of his more desperate hunters were impelled, when amid the chips of chewed boats, and the sinking limbs of torn comrades, they swam out of the white curds of the whale's direful wrath into the serene, exasperating sunlight, that smiled on, as if at a birth or a bridal. His three boats stove around him, and oars and men both whirling in the eddies, one captain, seizing the line knife from his broken prow, had dashed at the whale, as an Arkansas duelist at his foe, blindly seeking with a six-inch blade to reach the fathom-deep life of the whale. That captain was Ahab. And then it was, that suddenly sweeping his sickle-shaped lower jaw beneath him, Moby Dick had reaped away Ahab's leg, as a mower a blade of grass in the field. No turban Turk, no hired Venetian or Malay, could have smote him with more seeming malice. Small reason was there to doubt, then, that ever since that almost fatal encounter, Ahab had cherished a wild vindictiveness against the whale, all the more felt for that in his frantic morbidness he at last came to identify with him, not only all his bodily woes, but all his intellectual and spiritual exasperations. The white whale swam before him as the monomaniac incarnation of all those malicious agencies which some deep men feel eating in them, till they are left living on with half a heart and half a lung. That intangible malignity which has been from the beginning, to whose dominion even the modern Christians ascribe one half of the worlds, which the ancient Ophites of the East reverenced in their statue devil, Ahab did not fall down and worship it like them, but deliriously transferring its idea to the abhorred white whale, he pitted himself, all mutilated, against it. All that most maddens and torments, all that stirs up the lees of things, all truth with malice in it, all that cracks the sinews and cakes the brain, all the subtle demonisms of life and thought, all evil, to crazy Ahab, were visibly personified, and made practically assailable in Moby Dick. He piled upon the whale's white hump the sum of all the general rage and hate felt by his whole race from Adam down, and then, as if his chest had been a mortar, he burst his hot heart shell upon it. It is not probable that this monomania in him took its instant rise at the precise time of his bodily dismemberment. Then, in darting at the monster, knife in hand, he had but given loose to a sudden, passionate, corporal animosity, and when he received the stroke that tore him, he probably but felt the agonizing bodily laceration, but nothing more. Yet, when by this collision forced to turn towards home, and for long months of days and weeks, Ahab and Anguish lay stretched together in one hammock, rounding in midwinter the dreary, howling Patagonian cape, then it was, that his torn body and gashed soul bled into one another, and so interfusing, made him mad. That it was only then, on the homeward voyage, after the encounter, that the final monomania seized him, seems all but certain from the fact that, at intervals, during the passage, he was a raving lunatic, and, though on limb of a leg, yet such vital strength yet lurked in his Egyptian chest, and was moreover intensified by his delirium, that his mates were forced to lace him fast, even there, as he sailed, raving in his hammock. In a straight jacket, he swung to the mad rockings of the gales. And, when running into more sufferable latitudes, the ship, with mild stunsail spread, floated across the tranquil tropics, and, to all appearances, the old man's delirium seemed left behind him with the cape horn swells, and he came forth from his dark den into the blessed light and air, even then, when he bore that firm, collected front, however pale, and issued his calm orders once again, and his mates thanked God the direful madness was now gone, even then, Ahab, in his hidden self, raved. On. Human madness is oftentimes a cunning and most feline thing.
When you think it fled, it may have but become transfigured into some still subtler form. Ahab's full lunacy subsided not, but deepeningly contracted, like the unabated Hudson, when that noble Northman flows narrowly, but unfathomably through the Highland Gorge. But, as in his narrow-flowing monomania, not one jot of Ahab's broad madness had been left behind, so in that broad madness, not one jot of his great natural intellect had perished. That before living agent, now became the living instrument. If such a furious trope may stand, his special lunacy stormed his general sanity, and carried it, and turned all its concentered cannon upon its own mad mark, so that far from having lost his strength, Ahab, to that one end, did now possess a thousandfold more potency than ever he had sanely brought to bear upon any one reasonable object. This is much, yet Ahab's larger, darker, deeper part remains unhinted. But vain to popularize profundities, and all truth is profound. Winding far down from within the very heart of this spiked Hotel de Cluny where we here stand, however grand and wonderful, now quit it, and take your way, ye nobler, sadder souls, to those vast Roman halls of Thermes, where far beneath the fantastic towers of man's upper earth, his root of grandeur, his whole awful essence sits in bearded state, an antique buried beneath antiquities, and throned on torsos. So with a broken throne, the great gods mock that captive king, so like a caryatid, he patient sits, upholding on his frozen brow the piled entablatures of ages. Wind ye down there, ye prouder, sadder souls. Question that proud, sad king. A family likeness. Aye, he did beget ye, ye young exiled royalties, and from your grim sire only will the old state secret come. Now, in his heart, Ahab had some glimpse of this, namely, all my means are sane, my motive and my object mad. Yet without power to kill, or change, or shun the fact, he likewise knew that to mankind he did long dissemble, in some sort, did still. But that thing of his dissembling was only subject to his perceptibility, not to his will determinate. Nevertheless, so well did he succeed in that dissembling, that when with ivory leg he stepped ashore at last, no Nantucket or thought him otherwise than but naturally grieved, and that to the quick, with the terrible casualty which had overtaken him. The report of his undeniable delirium at sea was likewise popularly ascribed to a kindred cause. And so too, all the added moodiness which always afterwards, to the very day of sailing in the Pequot on the present voyage, sat brooding on his brow. Nor is it so very unlikely, that far from distrusting his fitness for another whaling voyage, on account of such dark symptoms, the calculating people of that prudent isle were inclined to harbor the conceit, that for those very reasons he was all the better qualified and set on edge, for a pursuit so full of rage and wildness as the bloody hunt of whales. Nod within and scorched without, with the infixed, unrelenting fangs of some incurable idea, such an one, could he be found, would seem the very man to dart his iron and lift his lance against the most appalling of all brutes. Or, if for any reason thought to be corporeally incapacitated for that, yet such an one would seem superlatively competent to cheer and howl on his underlings to the attack. But be all this as it may, certain it is, that with the mad secret of his unabated rage bolted up and keyed in him, Ahab had purposely sailed upon the present voyage with the one only and all-engrossing object of hunting the white whale. Had any one of his old acquaintances on shore but half dreamed of what was lurking in him then, how soon would their aghast and righteous souls have wrenched the ship from such a fiendish man? They were bent on profitable cruises, the profit to be counted down in dollars from the mint. He was intent on an audacious, immitigable, and supernatural revenge. Here, then, was this grey-headed, ungodly old man, chasing with curses a job's whale round the world, at the head of a crew, too, chiefly made up of mongrel renegades, and castaways, and cannibals, morally enfeebled also, by the incompetence of mere unaided virtue or right-mindedness in Starbuck, the invulnerable jollity of indifference and recklessness in Stubb, and the pervading mediocrity in Flask. Such a crew, so officered, seemed specially picked and packed by some infernal fatality to help him to his monomaniac revenge. How it was that they so aboundingly responded to the old man's ire, by what evil magic their souls were possessed, that at times his hate seemed almost theirs, the white whale as much their insufferable foe as his, how all this came to be what the white whale was to them, or how to their unconscious understandings, also, in some dim, unsuspected way, he might have seemed the gliding great demon of the seas of life, all this to explain, would be to dive deeper than Ishmael can go. The subterranean miner that works in us all, how can one tell whither leads his shaft by the ever-shifting, muffled sound of his pick? Who does not feel the irresistible arm drag? What skiff and toe of a 74 can stand still? For one, I gave myself up to the abandonment of the time and the place, but while yet all I rushed to encounter the whale, 
could see not in that brute but the deadliest ill. Chapter 42 The Whiteness of the Whale What the white whale was to Ahab has been hinted, what, at times, he was to me, as yet remains unsaid. Aside from those more obvious considerations touching Moby Dick, which could not but occasionally awaken in any man's soul some alarm, there was another thought, or rather vague, nameless horror concerning him, which at times by its intensity completely overpowered all the rest, and yet so mystical and well-nigh ineffable was it, that I almost despair of putting it in a comprehensible form. It was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. But how can I help to explain myself here, and yet, in some dim, random way, explain myself I must, else all these chapters might be not. Though in many natural objects, whiteness refiningly enhances beauty, as if imparting some special virtue of its own, as in marbles, japonicas, and pearls, and though various nations have in some way recognized a certain royal preeminence in this hue, even the barbaric, grand old kings of Pegu placing the titled Lord of the White Elephants above all their other magniloquent descriptions of dominion, and the modern kings of Siam unfurling the same snow-white quadruped in the royal standard, and the Hanoverian flag bearing the one figure of a snow-white charger, and the great Austrian Empire, Caesarian, heir to overlording Rome, having for the imperial color the same imperial hue, and though this preeminence in it applies to the human race itself, giving the white man ideal mastership over every dusky tribe, and though, besides, all this, whiteness has been even made significant of gladness, for among the Romans a white stone marked a joyful day, and though in other mortal sympathies. And symbolizings, this same hue is made the emblem of many touching, noble things, the innocence of brides, the benignity of age, though among the red men of America the giving of the white belt of wampum was the deepest pledge of honor, though in many climes, whiteness typifies the majesty of justice in the ermine of the judge, and contributes to the daily state of kings and queens drawn by milk-white steeds, though even in the higher mysteries of the most august religions it has been made the Symbol of the divine spotlessness and power, by the Persian fire worshippers, the white forked flame being held the holiest on the altar, and in the Greek mythologies, great Jove himself being made incarnate in a snow white bull, and though to the noble Iroquois, the midwinter sacrifice of the sacred white dog was by far the holiest festival of their theology, that spotless, faithful creature being held the purest envoy they could send to the great spirit with the annual tidings of their own. Fidelity, and though directly from the Latin word for white, all Christian priests derive the name of one part of their sacred vesture, the alb or tunic, worn beneath the cassock, and though among the holy pomps of the Romish faith, white is specially employed in the celebration of the Passion of our Lord, though in the vision of St. John, white robes are given to the redeemed, and the four and twenty elders stand clothed in white before the great white throne, and the Holy One that sitteth. They're white like wool, yet for all these accumulated associations, with whatever is sweet and honorable and sublime, there yet lurks an elusive something in the innermost idea of this hue, which strikes more of panic to the soul than that redness which affrights in blood. This elusive quality it is, which causes the thought of whiteness, when divorced from more kindly associations, and coupled with any object terrible in itself, to heighten that terror to the furthest bounds. Witness the white bear of the poles, and the white shark of the tropics, what but their smooth flaky whiteness makes them the transcendent horrors they are. That ghastly whiteness it is which imparts such an abhorrent mildness, even more loathsome than terrific, to the dumb bloating of their aspect. So that not the fierce fanged tiger in his heraldic coat can so stagger courage as the white-shrouded bear or shark asterisk. Asterisk with reference to the polar bear, it may possibly be urged by him who would fain go still deeper into this matter, that it is not the whiteness, separately regarded, which heightens the intolerable hideousness of that brute, for, analyzed, that heightened hideousness, it might be said, only rises from the circumstance, that the irresponsible ferociousness of the creature stands invested in the fleece of celestial innocence and love, and hence, by bringing together two such opposite emotions in our minds, the polar bear frightens us with so unnatural a contrast. But even assuming all this to be true, yet, were it not for the whiteness, you would not have that intensified terror. As for the white shark, the white gliding ghostliness of repose in that creature, when beheld in his ordinary moods, strangely tallies with the same quality in the polar quadruped. This peculiarity is most vividly hit by the French in the name they bestow upon that fish. The Romish mass for the dead begins with requiem eternum, eternal rest, whence requiem denominating the mass itself, and any other funeral music. Now, in allusion to the white, silent stillness of death in this shark, and the mild deadliness of his habits, the French call him requin. Bethink thee of the albatross, whence come those clouds of spiritual wonderment and pale dread, 
in which that white phantom sails in all imaginations? Not Coleridge first threw that spell, but God's great, unflattering laureate, nature, asterisk. Asterisk I remember the first albatross I ever saw. It was during a prolonged gale, in water's heart upon the Antarctic seas. From my forenoon watch below, I ascended to the overclouded deck, and there, dashed upon the main hatches, I saw a regal, feathery thing of unspotted whiteness, and with a hooked, Roman bill sublime. At intervals, it arched forth its vast archangel wings, as if to embrace some holy ark. Wondrous flutterings and throbbings shook it. Though bodily unharmed, it uttered cries, as some king's ghost in supernatural distress. Through its inexpressible, strange eyes, methought I peeped to secrets which took hold of God. As Abraham before the angels, I bowed myself, the white thing was so white, its wings so wide, and in those forever exiled waters, I had lost the miserable warping memories of traditions and of towns. Long I gazed at that prodigy of plumage. I cannot tell, can only hint, the things that darted through me then. But at last I awoke, and turning, asked a sailor what bird was this. Agoni, he replied. Goni. Never had heard that name before, is it conceivable that this glorious thing is utterly unknown to men ashore? Never. But some time after, I learned that Goni was some seaman's name for albatross. So that by no possibility could Coleridge's wild rhyme have had aught to do with those mystical impressions which were mine, when I saw that bird upon our deck. For neither had I then read the rhyme, nor knew the bird to be an albatross. Yet, in saying this, I do but indirectly burnish a little brighter the noble merit of the poem and the poet. I assert, then, that in the wondrous bodily whiteness of the bird chiefly lurks the secret of the spell, a truth the more evinced in this, that by a solecism of terms there are birds called grey albatrosses, and these I have frequently seen, but never with such emotions as when I beheld the Antarctic fowl. But how had the mystic thing been caught? Whisper it not, and I will tell, with a treacherous hook and line, as the fowl floated on the sea. At last the captain made a postman of it, tying a lettered, leathern tally round its neck, with the ship's time and place, and then letting it escape. But I doubt not, that leathern tally, meant for man, was taken off in heaven, when the white fowl flew to join the wingfolding, the invoking, and adoring cherubim. Most famous in our western annals and Indian traditions is that of the white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk-white charger, large-eyed, small-headed, bluff-chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in his lofty, overscorning carriage. He was the elected Xerxes of vast herds of wild horses, whose pastures in those days were only fenced by the Rocky Mountains and the Alleghenies. At their flaming head he westward trooped it like that chosen star which every evening leads on the hosts of light. The flashing cascade of his mane, the curving comet of his tail, invested him with housings more resplendent than gold and silver beaters could have furnished him. A most imperial and archangelical apparition of that unfallen, western world, which to the eyes of the old trappers and hunters revived the glories of those primeval times when Adam walked majestic as a god, bluff-browed and fearless as this mighty steed. Whether marching amid his aides and marshals in the van of countless cohorts that endlessly streamed it over the plains, like in Ohio, or whether with his circumambient subjects browsing all around at the horizon, the white steed gallopingly reviewed them with warm nostrils reddening through his cool milkiness, in whatever aspect he presented himself, always to the bravest Indians he was the object of trembling reverence and awe. Nor can it be questioned from what stands on legendary record of this noble horse, that it was his spiritual whiteness chiefly, which so clothed him with divineness, and that this divineness had that in it which, though commanding worship, at the same time enforced a certain nameless terror. But there are other instances where this whiteness loses all that accessory and strange glory which invests it in the white steed and albatross. What is it that in the albino man so peculiarly repels and often shocks the eye, as that sometimes he is loathed by his own kith and kin? It is that whiteness which invests him, a thing expressed by the name he bears. The albino is as well made as other men, has no substantive deformity, and yet this mere aspect of all-pervading whiteness makes him more strangely hideous than the ugliest abortion. Why should this be so? Nor, in quite other aspects, does nature in her least palpable but not the less malicious agencies, fail to enlist among her forces this crowning attribute of the terrible. From its snowy aspect, the gauntlet ghost of the southern seas has been denominated the white squall. Nor, in some historic instances, has the art of human malice omitted so potent an auxiliary. How wildly it heightens the effect of that passage in Froissart, when, masked in the snowy symbol of their faction, 
the desperate white hoods of Ghent murder their bailiff in the marketplace. Nor, in some things, does the common, hereditary experience of all mankind fail to bear witness to the supernaturalism of this hue. It cannot well be doubted that the one visible quality in the aspect of the dead which most appalls the gazer is the marble pallor lingering there, as if indeed that pallor were as much like the badge of consternation in the other world as of mortal trepidation here. And from that pallor of the dead, we borrow the expressive hue of the shroud in which we wrap them. Nor even in our superstitions do we fail to throw the same snowy mantle round our phantoms, all ghosts rising in a milk white fog, ye, yeah, while these terrors seize us, let us add, that even the king of terrors, when personified by the evangelist, rides on his pallid horse. Therefore, in his other moods, symbolize whatever grand or gracious thing he will by whiteness, no man can deny that in its profoundest idealized significance it calls up a peculiar apparition to the soul. But though without dissent this point be fixed, how is mortal man to account for it? To analyze it, would seem impossible. Can we, then, by the citation of some of those instances wherein this thing of whiteness, though for the time either wholly or in great part stripped of all direct associations calculated to impart to it aught fearful, but nevertheless, is found to exert over us the same sorcery, however modified, can we thus hope to light upon some chance clue to conduct us to the hidden cause we seek? Let us try. But in a matter like this, subtlety appeals to subtlety, and without imagination no man can follow another into these halls. And though, doubtless, some at least of the imaginative impressions about to be presented may have been shared by most men, yet few perhaps were entirely conscious of them at the time, and therefore may not be able to recall them now. Why do the man of untutored ideality, who happens to be but loosely acquainted with the peculiar character of the day, does the bare mention of Whitsuntide Marshall in the fancy such long, dreary, speechless processions of slow-pacing pilgrims, downcast and hooded with new-fallen snow? Or, to the unread, unsophisticated Protestant of the Middle American states, why does the passing mention of a white friar or a white nun evoke such an eyeless statue in the soul? Or what is there apart from the traditions of dungeon warriors and kings, which will not wholly account for it, that makes the White Tower of London tell so much more strongly on the imagination of an untraveled American than those other storied structures, its neighbors, the Bywood Tower, or even the Bloody? And those sublimer towers, the white mountains of New Hampshire, whence, in peculiar moods, comes that gigantic ghostliness over the soul at the bare mention of that name, while the thought of Virginia's Blue Ridge is full of a soft, dewy, distant dreaminess? Or why, irrespective of all latitudes and longitudes, does the name of the White Sea exert such a spectralness over the fancy, while that of the Yellow Sea lulls us with mortal thoughts of long lacquered mile afternoons on the waves, followed by the gaudiest and yet sleepiest of sunsets? Or, to choose a wholly unsubstantial instance, purely addressed to the fancy, why, in reading the old fairy tales of Central Europe, does the tall pale man of the heart's forests, whose changeless pallor unrustlingly glides through the green of the groves, why is this phantom more terrible than all the whooping imps of the Bloxburg? Nor is it, altogether, the remembrance of her cathedral toppling earthquakes, nor the stampedos of her frantic seas, nor the tearlessness of arid skies that never rain, nor the sight of her white field of leaning spires, wrenched copestones, and crosses all adroop, like canted yards of anchored fleets, and her suburban avenues of housewalls lying over upon each other, as a tossed pack of cards. It is not these things alone which make tearless Lima, the strangest, saddest city thou canst. See? For Lima has taken the white veil and there is a higher horror in this whiteness of her woe. Old as Pizarro, this whiteness keeps her ruins forever new, admits not the cheerful greenness of complete decay, spreads over her broken ramparts the rigid pallor of an apoplexy that fixes its own distortions. I know that, to the common apprehension, this phenomenon of whiteness is not confessed to be the prime agent in exaggerating the terror of objects otherwise terrible, nor to the unimaginative mind is there aught of terror in those appearances whose awfulness to another mind almost solely consists in this one phenomenon, especially when exhibited under any form at all approaching to muteness or universality. What I mean by these two statements may perhaps be respectively elucidated by the following examples. First, the mariner when drawing nigh the coasts of foreign lands, if by night he hear the roar of breakers, starts to vigilance, and feels just enough of trepidation to sharpen all his faculties, but under precisely similar circumstances, let him be called from his hammock to view his ship sailing through a midnight sea of milky whiteness as if from encircling headlands shoals of combed white bears were swimming round him, then he feels a silent, superstitious dread, the shrouded phantom of. The whitened waters is horrible to him as a real ghost, in vain the lead assures him he is still off soundings, Heart and helm they both go down, he never rests till blue water is under him again. 
Yet where is the mariner who will tell thee, sir, it was not so much the fear of striking hidden rocks, as the fear of that hideous whiteness that so stirred me. Second, to the native Indian of Peru, the continual sight of the Snohata head Andes conveys not of dread, except, perhaps, in the mere fancying of the eternal frosted desolateness reigning at such vast altitudes, and the natural conceit of what a fearfulness it would be to lose oneself in such inhuman solitudes. Much the same is it with the backwoods man of the West, who with comparative indifference views an unbounded prairie sheeted with driven snow, no shadow of tree or twig to break the fixed trance of whiteness. Not so the sailor, beholding the scenery of the Antarctic seas, where at times, by some infernal trick of ledger domain in the powers of frost and air, he, shivering and half shipwrecked, instead of rainbows speaking hope and solace to his misery, views what seems a boundless churchyard grinning upon him with its lean ice monuments and splintered crosses. But thou sayest, methinks that white lead chapter about whiteness is but a white flag hung out from a craven soul, thou surrenderest to a hypo, Ishmael. Tell me, why this strong young colt, fold in some peaceful valley of Vermont, far removed from all beasts of prey, why is it that upon the sunniest day, if you but shake a fresh buffalo robe behind him, so that he cannot even see it, but only smells its wild animal muskiness, why will he start, snort, and with bursting eyes paw the ground in frenzies of affright? There is no remembrance in him of any gorings of wild creatures in his green northern home, so that the strange muskiness he smells cannot recall to him anything associated with the experience of former perils. For what knows he, this New England colt, of the black bisons of distant Oregon? No, but here thou beholdest even in a dumb brute, the instinct of the knowledge of the demonism in the world. Though thousands of miles from Oregon, still when he smells that savage musk, the rending, goring bison herds are as present as to the deserted wild foal of the prairies, which this instant they may be trampling into dust. Thus, then, the muffled rawlings of a milky sea, the bleak rustlings of the festooned frosts of mountains, the desolate shiftings of the windrowed snows of prairies, all these, to Ishmael, are as the shaking of that buffalo robe to the frightened colt. Though neither knows where lie the nameless things of which the mystic sign gives forth such hints, yet with me, as with the colt, somewhere those things must exist. Though in many of its aspects this visible world seems formed in love, the invisible spheres were formed in fright. But not yet have we solved the incantation of this whiteness, and learn why it appeals with such power to the soul, and more strange and far more portentous why, as we have seen, it is at once the most meaning symbol of spiritual things, nay, the very veil of the Christian's deity, and yet should be as it is, the intensifying agent in things the most appalling to mankind. Is it that by its indefiniteness it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe, and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation, when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? Or is it, that as in essence whiteness is not so much a color as the visible absence of color, and at the same time, the concrete of all colors, is it for these reasons that there is such a dumb blankness, full of meaning, in a wide landscape of snows, a colorless, all color of atheism from which we shrink? And when we consider that other theory of the natural philosophers, that all other earthly hues, every stately or lovely emblazoning, the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, yeah, and the gilded velvets of butterflies, and the butterfly cheeks of young girls, all these are, but subtle deceits, not actually inherent in substances, but only laid on from without so that all deified nature absolutely paints like the harlot, whose allurements cover nothing but the charnel house within, and when we proceed further, and consider that the mystical cosmetic which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light, forever remains white or colorless in itself, and if operating without medium upon matter, would touch all objects, even tulips and roses, with its own blank tinge, pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us a leper, and like willful travelers in Lapland, who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched infidel gazes himself. Blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. And of all these things the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt? Chapter 43 Hark! Hist! Did you hear that noise, Kabako? It was the middle watch, a fair moonlight, the seamen were standing in a cordon, extending from one of the fresh water butts in the waist, to the scuttle butt near the taffrail. In this manner, they passed the buckets to fill the scuttle butt. Standing, for the most part, on the hallowed precincts of the quarter deck, they were careful not to speak or rustle their feet. From hand to hand, the buckets went in the deepest silence, only broken by the occasional flap of a sail, and the steady hum of the unceasingly advancing keel. It was in the midst of this repose, that Archie, one of the cordon, whose post was near the after hatches, whispered to his neighbor, a cholo, the words above. 
hissed. Did you hear that noise, Kabako? Take the bucket, will ye, Archie? What noise do ye mean? There it is again, under the hatches, don't you hear it, a cough, it sounded like a cough. Cough be damned. Pass along that return bucket. There again, there it is, it sounds like two or three sleepers, turning over, now. Karumba. Have done, shipmate, will ye? It's the three soaked biscuits ye eat for supper, turning over inside of ye, nothing else. Look to the bucket. Say what ye will, shipmate, I've sharp ears. I, you are the chap, ain't ye, that heard the hum of the old Quakeress's knitting needles fifty miles at sea from Nantucket, you're the chap. Grin away, we'll see what turns up. Harky, Kabako, there is somebody down in the afterhold that has not yet been seen on deck, and I suspect our old mobile knows something of it too. I heard Stubb tell Flask, one morning watch, that there was something of that sort in the wind. Tish. The Bucket. Chapter 44. The Chart. Had you followed Captain Ahab down into his cabin after the squall that took place on the night succeeding that wild ratification of his purpose with his crew, you would have seen him go to a locker in the transom, and bringing out a large wrinkled roll of yellowish sea charts, spread them before him on his screwed down table. Then seating himself before it, you would have seen him intently study the various lines and shadings which there met his eye, and with slow but steady pencil trace additional courses over spaces that before were blank. At intervals, he would refer to piles of old logbooks beside him, wherein were set down the seasons and places in which, on various former voyages of various ships, sperm whales had been captured or seen. While thus employed, the heavy pewter lamp suspended in chains over his head, continually rocked with the motion of the ship, and forever threw shifting gleams and shadows of lines upon his wrinkled brow, till it almost seemed that while he himself was marking out lines and courses on the wrinkled charts, some invisible pencil was also tracing lines and courses upon the deeply marked chart of his forehead. But it was not this night in particular that, in the solitude of his cabin, Ahab thus pondered over his charts. Almost every night they were brought out, almost every night some pencil marks were effaced, and others were substituted. For with the charts of all four oceans before him, Ahab was threading a maze of currents and eddies, with a view to the more certain accomplishment of that monomaniac thought of his soul. Now, to anyone not fully acquainted with the ways of the Leviathans, it might seem an absurdly hopeless task thus to seek out one solitary creature in the unhoped oceans of this planet. But not so did it seem to Ahab, who knew the sets of all tides and currents, and thereby calculating the driftings of the sperm whale's food, and, also, calling to mind the regular, ascertained seasons for hunting him in particular latitudes, could arrive at reasonable surmises, almost approaching to certainties, concerning the timeliest day to be upon this or that ground in search of his prey. So assured, indeed, is the fact concerning the periodicalness of the sperm whales resorting to given waters, that many hunters believe that, could he be closely observed and studied throughout the world, were the logs for one voyage of the entire whale fleet carefully collated, then the migrations of the sperm whale would be found to correspond in invariability to those of the herring shoals or the flights of swallows. On this hint, attempts have been made to construct elaborate migratory charts of the sperm whale, asterisk. Asterisk since the above was written, the statement is happily borne. Out by an official circular, issued by Lt. Maury, of the National Observatory, Washington, April 16, 1851. By that circular, it appears that precisely such a chart is in course of completion, and portions of it are presented in the circular. This chart divides the ocean into districts of 5 degrees of latitude by 5 degrees of longitude, perpendicularly through each of which districts are 12 columns for the 12 months, and horizontally through each, of which districts are three lines, one to show the number of days that have been spent in each month in every district, and the two others to show the number of days in which whales, sperm or right, have been seen. Besides, when making a passage from one feeding ground to another, the sperm whales, guided by some infallible instinct, say, rather, secret intelligence from the deity, mostly swim in veins, as they are called, continuing their way along a given ocean line with such undeviating exactitude, that no ship ever sailed her course, by any chart, with one tithe of such marvelous precision. Though, in these cases, the direction taken by any one whale be straight as a surveyor's parallel, and though the line of advance be strictly confined to its own unavoidable, straight wake, yet the arbitrary vein in which at these times he is said to swim, 
generally embraces some few miles in width, more or less, as the vein is presumed to expand or contract, but never exceeds the visual sweep from the whale ship's mastheads, when circumspectly gliding along this magic zone. The sum is, that at particular seasons within that breadth and along that path, migrating whales may with great confidence be looked for. And hence not only at substantiated times, upon well-known separate feeding grounds, could Ahab hope to encounter his prey, but in crossing the widest expanses of water between those grounds he could, by his art, so place and time himself on his way, as even then not to be wholly without prospect of a meeting. There was a circumstance which at first sight seemed to entangle his delirious but still methodical scheme. But not so in the reality, perhaps. Though the gregarious sperm whales have their regular seasons for particular grounds, yet in general you cannot conclude that the herds which haunted such and such a latitude or longitude this year, say, will turn out to be identically the same with those that were found there the preceding season, though there are peculiar and unquestionable instances where the contrary of this has proved true. In general, the same remark, only within a less wide limit, applies to the solitaries and hermits among the matured, aged sperm whales. So that though Moby Dick had in a former year been seen, for example, on what is called the Seychelles ground in the Indian Ocean, or Volcano Bay on the Japanese coast, yet it did not follow, that were the Pequod to visit either of those spots at any subsequent corresponding season, she would infallibly encounter him there. So, too, with some other feeding grounds, where he had at times revealed himself. But all these seemed only his casual stopping places and ocean inns, so to speak, not his places of prolonged abode. And where Ahab's chances of accomplishing his object have hitherto been spoken of, allusion has only been made to whatever wayside, antecedent, extra prospects were his, ere a particular set time or place were attained, when all possibilities would become probabilities, and, as Ahab fondly thought, every possibility the next thing to a certainty. That particular set time and place were conjoined in the one technical phrase, the season on the line. For there and then, for several consecutive years, Moby Dick had been periodically descried, lingering in those waters for a while, as the sun, in its annual round, loiters for a predicted interval in any one sign of the zodiac. There it was, too, that most of the deadly encounters with the white whale had taken place, there the waves were. Storied with his deeds, there also was that tragic spot where the monomaniac old man had found the awful motive to his vengeance. But in the cautious comprehensiveness and unloitering vigilance with which Ahab threw his brooding soul into this unfaltering hunt, he would not permit himself to rest all his hopes upon the one crowning fact above mentioned, however flattering it might be to those hopes, nor in the sleeplessness of his vow could he so tranquilize his unquiet heart as to postpone all intervening quest. Now, the Pequot had sailed from Nantucket at the very beginning of the season on the line. No possible endeavor then could enable her commander to make the great passage southwards, double Cape Horn, and then running down 60 degrees of latitude arrive in the equatorial Pacific in time to cruise there. Therefore, he must wait for the next ensuing season. Yet the premature hour of the Pequod sailing had, perhaps, been correctly selected by Ahab, with a view to this very complexion of things. Because, an interval of 365 days and nights was before him, an interval which, instead of impatiently enduring ashore, he would spend in a miscellaneous hunt, if by chance the white whale, spending his vacation in seas far remote from his periodical feeding grounds, should turn up his wrinkled brow off the Persian Gulf, or in the Bengal Bay, or China Seas, or in any other waters haunted by his race. So that monsoons, pampas, nor'westers, harmattans, trades, any wind but the Levanter and Samoon might blow Moby Dick into the devious zigzag world circle of the Pequod circumnavigating wake. But granting all this, yet, regarded discreetly and coolly, seems it not but a mad idea, this, that in the broad boundless ocean, one solitary whale, even if encountered, should be thought capable of individual recognition from his hunter, even as a white-bearded mufti in the thronged thoroughfares of Constantinople? Yes. For the peculiar snow-white brow of Moby Dick, and his snow-white hump, could not but be unmistakable. And have I not tallied the whale, Ahab would mutter to himself, as after poring over his charts till long after midnight he would throw himself back in reveries, tallied him, and shall he escape? His broad fins are bored, and scalloped out like a lost sheep's ear. And here, his mad mind would run on in a breathless race, till a weariness and faintness of pondering came over him, and in the open air of the deck he would seek to recover his strength. Ah, God! What trances of torments does that man endure who is consumed with one unachieved revengeful desire? He sleeps with clenched hands, and wakes with his own bloody nails in his palms. 
Often, when forced from his hammock by exhausting and intolerably vivid dreams of the night, which, resuming his own intense thoughts through the day, carried them on amid a clashing of frenzies, and whirled them round and round and round in his blazing brain, till the very throbbing of his life spot became insufferable anguish, and when, as was sometimes the case, these spiritual throes in him heaved his being up from its base, and a chasm seemed opening in him, from which forked flames and lightning shot up, and accursed fiends beckoned him to leap down among them, when this Helen himself yawned beneath him, a wild cry would be heard through the ship, and with glaring eyes Ahab would burst from his stateroom, as though escaping from a bed that was on fire. Yet these, perhaps, instead of being the unsuppressible symptoms of some latent weakness, or fright at his own resolve, were but the plainest tokens of its intensity. For, at such times, crazy Ahab, the scheming, unappeasedly steadfast hunter of the white whale, this Ahab that had gone to his hammock, was not the agent that so caused him to burst from it in horror again. The latter was the eternal, living principle or soul in him, and in sleep, being for the time dissociated from the characterizing mind, which at other times employed it for its outer vehicle or agent, it spontaneously sought escape from the scorching contiguity of the frantic thing, of which, for the time, it was no longer an integral. But as the mind does not exist unless leagued with the soul, therefore it must have been that, in Ahab's case, yielding up all his thoughts and fancies to his one supreme purpose, that purpose, by its own sheer inveteracy of will, forced itself against gods and devils into a kind of self-assumed, independent being of its own. Nay, could grimly live and burn, while the common vitality to which it was conjoined, fled horror-stricken from the unbidden and unfathered birth. Therefore, the tormented spirit that glared out of bodily eyes, when what seemed Ahab rushed from his room, was for the time but a vacated thing, a formless somnambulistic being, a ray of living light, to be sure, but without an object to color, and therefore a blankness in itself. God help thee, old man, thy thoughts have created a creature in thee, and he whose intense thinking thus makes him a Prometheus, a vulture feeds upon that heart forever, that vulture the very creature he creates. Chapter 45 The Affidavit so far as what there may be of a narrative in this book, and, indeed, as indirectly touching one or two very interesting and curious particulars in the habits of sperm whales, the foregoing chapter, in its earlier part, is as important a one as will be found in this volume, but the leading matter of it requires to be still further and more familiarly enlarged upon, in order to be adequately understood, and moreover to take away any incredulity which a profound ignorance of the entire subject may induce in some minds, as to the natural verity of the main points of this affair. I care not to perform this part of my task methodically, but shall be content to produce the desired impression by separate citations of items, practically or reliably known to me as a whaleman, and from these citations, I take it, the conclusion aimed at will naturally follow of itself. First, I have personally known three instances where a whale, after receiving a harpoon, has effected a complete escape, and, after an interval, in one instance of three years, has been again struck by the same hand, and slain, when the two irons, both marked by the same private cipher, have been taken from the body. In the instance where three years intervened between the flinging of the two harpoons, and I think it may have been something more than that, the man who darted them happening, in the interval, to go on a trading ship on a voyage to Africa, went ashore there, joined a discovery party, and penetrated far into the interior, where he traveled for a period of nearly two years, often endangered by serpents, savages, tigers, poisonous miasmas, with all the other common perils incident to wandering in the heart of unknown regions. Meanwhile, the whale he had struck must also have been on its travels, no doubt it had thrice circumnavigated the globe, brushing with its flanks all the coasts of Africa, but to no purpose. This man and this whale again came together, and the one vanquished the other. I say I, myself, have known three instances similar to this, that is in two of them I saw the whale struck, and, upon the second attack, saw the two irons with the respective marks cut in them, afterwards taken from the dead fish. In the three-year instance, it so fell out that I was in the boat both times, first and last, and the last time distinctly recognized a peculiar sort of huge mole under the whale's eye, which I had observed there three years previous. I say three years, but I am pretty sure it was more than that. Here are three instances, then, which I personally know the truth of, but I have heard of many other instances from persons whose veracity in the matter there is no good ground to impeach. Secondly, it is well known in the sperm whale fishery, however ignorant the world ashore may be of it, that there have been several memorable historical instances where a particular whale in the ocean has been at distant times and places popularly cognizable. Why such a whale became thus marked was not altogether and originally owing to his bodily peculiarities as distinguished from other whales, 
for however peculiar in that respect any chance whale may be, they soon put an end to his peculiarities by killing him and boiling him down into a peculiarly valuable oil. No, the reason was this, that from the fatal experiences of the fishery there hung a terrible prestige of perilousness about such a whale as there did about Rinaldo Rinaldini, insomuch that most fishermen were content to recognize him by merely touching their tarpaulins when he would be discovered lounging by them on the sea, without seeking to cultivate a more intimate acquaintance. Like some poor devils ashore that happen to know an irascible great man, they make distant unobtrusive salutations to him in the street, lest if they pursued the acquaintance further, they might receive a summary thump for their presumption. But not only did each of these famous whales enjoy great individual celebrity, nay, you may call it an ocean-wide renown, not only was he famous in life and now is immortal in folksal stories after death, but he was admitted into all the rights, privileges, and distinctions of a name, had as much a name indeed as Cambyses or Caesar. Was it not so, O Timor Tom? Thou famed Leviathan, scarred like an iceberg, who so long didst lurk in the oriental straits of that name, whose spout was off seen from the palmy beach of Ambe. Was it not so, O New Zealand Jack? Thou terror of all cruisers that crossed their wakes in the vicinity of the tattoo land? Was it not so, O Morquan? King of Japan, whose lofty jet they say at times assumed the semblance of a snow-white cross against the sky? Was it not so, O Don Miguel? Thou Chilean whale, marked like an old tortoise with mystic hieroglyphics upon the back. In plain prose, here are four whales as well known to the students of cetacean history as Marius or Scylla to the classic scholar. But this is not all. New Zealand Tom and Don Miguel, after at various times creating great havoc among the boats of different vessels, were finally gone in quest of, systematically hunted out, chased and killed by valiant whaling captains, who heaved up their anchors with that express object as much in view, as in setting out through the Narragansett woods, Captain Butler of old had it in his mind to capture that notorious murderous savage Anawan, the headmost warrior of the Indian King Philip. I do not know where I can find a better place than just here, to make mention of one or two other things, which to me seem important, as in printed form establishing in all respects the reasonableness of the whole story of the white whale, more especially the catastrophe. For this is one of those disheartening instances where truth requires full as much bolstering as error. So ignorant are most landsmen of some of the plainest and most palpable wonders of the world, that without some hints touching the plain facts, historical and otherwise, of the fishery, they might scout at Moby Dick as a monstrous fable, or still worse and more detestable, a hideous and intolerable allegory. First, though most men have some vague flitting ideas of the general perils of the grand fishery, yet they have nothing like a fixed, vivid conception of those perils, and the frequency with which they recur. One reason perhaps is, that not one in fifty of the actual disasters and deaths by casualties in the fishery, ever finds a public record at home, however transient and immediately forgotten that record. Do you suppose that that poor fellow there, who this moment perhaps caught by the whale line off the coast of New Guinea, is being carried down to the bottom of the sea by the sounding leviathan, do you suppose that that poor fellow's name will appear in the newspaper obituary you will read tomorrow at your breakfast? No because the mails are very irregular between here and New Guinea. In fact, did you ever hear what might be called regular news direct or indirect from New Guinea? Yet I tell you that upon one particular voyage which I made to the Pacific, among many others we spoke thirty different ships, every one of which had had a death by a whale, some of them more than one, and three that had each lost a boat's crew. For God's sake, be economical with your lamps and candles. Not a gallon you burn, but at least one drop of man's blood was spilled for it. Secondly, people ashore have indeed some indefinite idea that a whale is an enormous creature of enormous power, but I have ever found that when narrating to them some specific example of this twofold enormousness, they have significantly complimented me upon my facetiousness, when, I declare upon my soul, I had no more idea of being facetious than Moses, when he wrote the history of the plagues of Egypt. But fortunately the special point I here seek can be established upon testimony entirely independent of my own. That point is this, the sperm whale is in some cases sufficiently powerful, knowing, and judiciously malicious, as with direct aforethought to stave in, utterly destroy, and sink a large ship, and what is more, the sperm whale has done it. First, in the year 1820 the ship Essex, Captain Pollard, of Nantucket, was cruising in the Pacific Ocean. One day she saw spouts, lowered her boats, and gave chase to a shoal of sperm whales. Ere long, several of the whales were wounded, when, suddenly, a very large whale escaping from the boats, issued from the shoal, and bore directly down upon the ship. 
Dashing his forehead against her hull, he so stove her in, that in less than ten minutes she settled down and fell over. Not a surviving plank of her has been seen since. After the severest exposure, part of the crew reached the land in their boats. Being returned home at last, Captain Pollard once more sailed for the Pacific in command of another ship, but the gods shipwrecked him again upon unknown rocks and breakers, for the second time his ship was utterly lost, and forthwith forswearing the sea, he has never tempted it since. At this day Captain Pollard is a resident of Nantucket. I have seen Owen Chase, who was chief mate of the Essex at the time of the tragedy, I have read his plain and faithful narrative, I have conversed with his son, and all this within a few miles of the scene of the catastrophe, asterisk. Asterisk the following are extracts from Chase's narrative, every fact seemed to warrant me in concluding that it was anything but chance which directed his operations, he made two several attacks upon the ship, at a short interval between them, both of which, according to their direction, were calculated to do us the most injury, by being made ahead, and thereby combining the speed of the two objects for the shock, to effect which, the exact maneuvers which he made were necessary. His aspect was most horrible, and such as indicated resentment and fury. He came directly from the shoal which we had just before entered, and in which we had struck three of his companions, as if fired with revenge for their sufferings. Again, at all events, the whole circumstances taken together, all happening before my own eyes, and producing, at the time, impressions in my mind of decided, calculating mischief, on the part of the whale, many of which impressions I cannot now recall, induce me to be satisfied that I am correct in my opinion. Here are his reflections some time after quitting the ship, during a black night, in an open boat, when almost despairing of reaching any hospitable shore. The dark ocean and swelling waters were nothing, the fears of being swallowed up by some dreadful tempest, or dashed upon hidden rocks, with all the other ordinary subjects of fearful contemplation, seemed scarcely entitled to a moment's thought, the dismal-looking wreck, and the horrid aspect and revenge of the whale, wholly engrossed my reflections, until they again made its appearance. In another place, page 45, he speaks of the mysterious and mortal attack of the animal. Secondly, the ship union, also of Nantucket, was in the year 1807 totally lost off the Azores by a similar onset, but the authentic particulars of this catastrophe I have never chanced to encounter, though from the whale hunters I have now and then heard casual allusions to it. Thirdly, some 18 or 20 years ago Commodore J., then commanding an American sloop of war of the first class, happened to be dining with a party of whaling captains, on board an Nantucket ship in the harbor of Oahu, Sandwich Islands. Conversation turning upon whales, the Commodore was pleased to be skeptical touching the amazing strength ascribed to them by the professional gentleman present. He peremptorily denied for example, that any whale could so smite his stout sloop of war as to cause her to leak so much as a thimbleful. Very good, but there is more coming. Some weeks after, the Commodore set sail in this impregnable craft for Valparaiso. But he was stopped on the way by a portly sperm whale, that begged a few moments confidential business with him. That business consisted in fetching the Commodore's craft such a thwack, that with all his pumps going he made straight for the nearest port to heave down and repair. I am not superstitious, but I consider the Commodore's interview with that whale as providential. Was not Saul of Tarsus converted from unbelief by a similar fright? I tell you, the sperm whale will stand no nonsense. I will now refer you to Langsdorff's voyages for a little circumstance in point, peculiarly interesting to the writer hereof. Langsdorff, you must know by the way, was attached to the Russian Admiral Krusenstern's famous discovery expedition in the beginning of the present century. Captain Langsdorff thus begins his 17th chapter. By the 13th of May our ship was ready to sail, and the next day we were out in the open sea, on our way to Akich. The weather was very clear and fine, but so intolerably cold that we were obliged to keep on our fur clothing. For some days we had very little wind, it was not till the 19th that a brisk gale from the northwest sprang up. An uncommon large whale, the body of which was larger than the ship itself, lay almost at the surface of the water, but was not perceived by anyone on board till the moment when the ship, which was in full sail, was almost upon him, so that it was impossible to prevent its striking against him. We were thus placed in the most imminent danger, as this gigantic creature, setting up its back, raised the ship three feet at least out of the water. The masts reeled, and the sails fell altogether, while we who were below all sprang instantly upon the deck, concluding that we had struck upon some rock, instead of this we saw the monster sailing off with the utmost gravity and solemnity. Captain Dwolf applied immediately to the pumps to examine whether or not the vessel had received any damage from the shock, 
but we found that very happily it had escaped entirely uninjured. Now, the Captain Dwolf here alluded to as commanding the ship in question is a New Englander who, after a long life of unusual adventures as a sea captain, this day resides in the village of Dorchester near Boston. I have the honor of being a nephew of his. I have particularly questioned him concerning this passage in Langsdorf. He substantiates every word. The ship, however, was by no means a large one, a Russian craft built on the Siberian coast and purchased by my uncle after bartering away the vessel in which he sailed from home. In that up-and-down manly book of old-fashioned adventure, so full, too, of honest wonders, the voyage of Lionel Wafer, one of ancient Dampier's old chums, I found a little matter set down so like that just quoted from Langsdorff, that I cannot forbear inserting it here for a corroborative example, if such be needed. Lionel, it seems, was on his way to John Ferdinando, as he calls the modern Juan Fernandez. In our way thither, he says, about four o'clock in the morning, when we were about 150 leagues from the main of America, our ship felt a terrible shock, which put our men in such consternation that they could hardly tell where they were or what to think, but everyone began to prepare for death. And, indeed, the shock was so sudden and violent, that we took it for granted the ship had struck against a rock, but when the amazement was a little over, we cast the lead, and sounded, but found no ground. Asterisk 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 the suddenness of the shock made the guns leap in their carriages, and several of the men were shaken out of their hammocks. Captain Davis, who lay with his head on a gun, was thrown out of his cabin. Lionel then goes on to impute the shock to an earthquake, and seems to substantiate the imputation by stating that a great earthquake, somewhere about that time, did actually do great mischief along the Spanish land. But I should not much wonder if, in the darkness of that early hour of the morning, the shock was after all caused by an unseen whale vertically bumping the hull from beneath. I might proceed with several more examples, one way or another known to me, of the great power and malice at times of the sperm whale. In more than one instance, he has been known, not only to chase the assailing boats back to their ships, but to pursue the ship itself, and long withstand all the lances hurled at him from its decks. The English ship Pussy Hall can tell a story on that head, and, as for his strength, let me say that there have been examples where the lines attached to a running sperm whale have, in a calm, been transferred to the ship and secured there, the whale towing her great hull through the water, as a horse walks off with a cart. Again, it is very often observed that, if the sperm whale, once struck, is allowed time to rally, he then acts, not so often with blind rage, as with willful, deliberate designs of destruction to his pursuers, nor is it without conveying some eloquent indication of his character, that upon being attacked he will frequently open his mouth, and retain it in that dread expansion for several consecutive minutes. But I must be content with only one more and a concluding illustration, a remarkable and most significant one, by which you will not fail to see, that not only is the most marvelous event in this book corroborated by plain facts of the present day, but that these marvels, like all marvels, are mere repetitions of the ages, so that for the millionth time we say Amen with Solomon, verily there is nothing new under the sun. In the sixth Christian century lived Procopius, a Christian magistrate of Constantinople, in the days when Justinian was emperor and Belisarius general. As many know, he wrote the history of his own times, a work every way of uncommon value. By the best authorities, he has always been considered a most trustworthy and unexaggerating historian, except in some one or two particulars, not at all affecting the matter presently to be mentioned. Now, in this history of his, Procopius mentions that, during the term of his prefecture at Constantinople, a great sea monster was captured in the neighboring Propontis, or Sea of Marmora, after having destroyed vessels at intervals in those waters for a period of more than fifty years. A fact thus set down in substantial history cannot easily be gainsaid. Nor is there any reason it should be. Of what precise species this sea monster was, is not mentioned. But as he destroyed ships, as well as for other reasons, he must have been a whale, and I am strongly inclined to think a sperm whale. And I will tell you why. For a long time I fancied that the sperm whale had been always unknown in the Mediterranean and the deep waters connecting with it. Even now I am certain that those seas are not, and perhaps never can be, in the present constitution of things, a place for his habitual gregarious resort. But further investigations have recently proved to me that in modern times there have been isolated instances of the presence of the sperm whale in the Mediterranean. I am told, on good authority, that on the Barbary coast, a Commodore Davis of the British Navy found the skeleton of a sperm whale. Now, as a vessel of war readily passes through the Dardanelles, hence a sperm whale could, by the same route, pass out of the Mediterranean into the Propontis. 
In the Propontis, as far as I can learn, none of that peculiar substance called Brit is to be found, the aliment of the right whale. But I have every reason to believe that the food of the sperm whale, squid or cuttlefish lurks at the bottom of that sea, because large creatures, but by no means the largest of that sort, have been found at its surface. If, then, you properly put these statements together, and reason upon them a bit, you will clearly perceive that, according to all human reasoning, Procopius's sea monster, that for half a century stowed the ships of a Roman emperor, must in all probability have been a sperm whale.